I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for writing this book because I think it's the first time we've got a chance to read truly about a legend. I mean, John's life was so extraordinary and so extreme, yet at the same time, you were just living a normal life. You were just two normal people that got together at a young age and the next minute, mega stardom. It must have been extraordinary for you to live through it. Um, it's very hard to describe, actually, because it happened so quickly. But yes, I mean, one minute we're students, the art college in Liverpool... He's broke and I've got my grant. Um, he smokes ciggies and half my grant goes on his ciggies. Uh, it was simple, simple. We were hungry, we were poor, but we were talented. <laughs> well, I think so at the time. John was obviously a genius. There's no question about his writing, musical ability. But I think at the same time, he was very flawed in some of his behavioural patterns and the way he treated you at times. How easy was it for you to cope with that day to day? I mean, at one point he beat you up and you didn't know whether to go back to him or whether to leave him. In other words, day to day, what was he like? Well, day to day, it's hard to... He was a very complex character, even at that stage. But then I think because, obviously because, and I put it in the book, the fact that he had such a disjointed and, and fractured childhood. And of course, when I met him, he was a teenager. Uh, he didn't want to go to college. His aunt Mimi got him the interview and he really was a rebel. He really didn't know where he was going and what he wanted to do, apart from the fact that he loved music. And he was also a prolific writer as a child. I mean, he wrote lots of little stories, books with illustrations and everything else. I don't think John really realised how talented he was because he had a massive chip on his shoulder. And I think it, that lasted most of his life. He couldn't get rid of his demons. And I think that I've expressed that in the book. But day to day with John was, was never the same. You know, you would never know from one minute to the next what kind of uh, mood he was in, what reaction. It was like living on a knife edge to a certain extent. When he was good, he was very, very good. And when he was bad, he was very naughty. What do you think it was that led to the, the problems in his life? Well, I think obviously the fact that he, he lost his mother at a very um, important age when he was 17 and he was just getting to know her. He had to choose between his mother and father. He lost his his beloved Uncle George, who was Mimi's husband. He lived with Mimi, who was a bit of a harridan, and gave him a bit of a hard time. Um, he should have been living with his mother, but he wasn't. I mean, it's so complicated. And the whole family uh, was run by women, you know, and they were all tough, real tough cookies, these ladies. To my experience, and uh, chagrin sometimes, but for him, his life was so packed his early life with with such trauma and such extremes that it had to have an effect on him i mean if you take a child from what from the age of one to seven then you have the man and i think what happened to john between those ages those years really scarred him for life we're here today with cynthia lennon talking to her exclusively about her life with john lennon let's go right back to the beginning how did you meet john well, I went to art college, Liverpool Art College. I first went to the junior art school, then went to art college. My dreams were to be a, an artist, commercial, teacher, didn't matter. That's, that was my dream. Only I met up with this guy who happened to be um, not very popular with the lecturers and everybody else. He just happened to be there. And every time I saw him, he would be surrounded by sycophants and they'd all be falling about laughing. And I thought, I, every time I looked at him, I thought, you know, what's this guy got? I mean, he was a real scruff. He was a real teddy boy. He looked as though he'd punch you as soon as look at you. And he ended up in, in the class that I was in, which was a lettering class. He didn't want to be there. And of course, being the student that I was, I had everything perfect. You know, I was a perfectionist. I had all the right paints, rulers, brushes, uh, pencils, and he sat behind me and kept borrowing and I never got them back. <laughs> and then eventually, you know, I kept, I kept thinking, I'm, I don't know, I, I really don't understand this guy, but I quite liked him because he was so outrageous and he made everybody laugh. And there was one particular day when we were all testing each other's eye, eyes on the blackboard where we were. And we both found out that our eyesight was identical. 
So that was the connection. You know. What happened next? Well, during that period, when um, he w- he used to walk in with a guitar over his shoulder, looking as though he was about to kill somebody. But this particular day, <laughs> he he came in and he just sat in a corner, and everybody else went for lunch, and and I was still trying to gather all my pens, pencils and things that he'd nicked. And he just sat in the corner and he played uh, Ain't She Sweet all the way through. And I just looked at him and I thought, well, that's for me. (laughs) I mean, he just blew me away because I saw a completely different side of him. And from then on, it was was like, it took quite a while. But we had a party at college, um, breaking up time, and we got some records not CDs as they are now, records and a bit of booze in and it was the end of term and he turned up and we danced and that was it. He was very caring towards you and reading some of the letters that he wrote, I mean, he was besotted with you. I love you, I love you, I love you. I think he wrote 50,000 times on this one letter. Our first Christmas together, yes. I don't know, he obviously saw something in me that wasn't so obvious and I saw something in him that wasn't so obvious. And But they do say that opposites attract and I think we had a, a, um, a situation where I'd just lost my father when, when I was 17. He'd lost his mother through a tragic car accident when he was 17. And I think that even though we didn't talk about it and I didn't know about it at the time, I think that must have drawn us together because we had an empathy about uh, tragedy. You know, it's as simple as that. But we were both creative. We both, both did artistic things. Him, his artistic way was slightly different to mine. I did it by the book, he didn't. And I think that was just it. And then, of course, um, you know, I he loved Bridget Bardot. <laughs> uh, so I grew my hair and I went blonde, hill-tone blonde. <laughs> so he had his own little Bridget Bardot. You mentioned the tragedy that beset both of you. It seems to me that you got strength out of the tragedy and the adversity. But John took it as an affront and became angry. He seemed very angry and bitter in parts of the book. He was. He couldn't let it out. He, he was not... He couldn't express himself. The way John expressed himself was with uh, wicked humour and with his cartoons. I mean, everybody knows about his, his um, unbelievably cruel and um, cartoons about cripples. And I mean, he, there was nothing nice that came out of his artistry. At that time and his humor was cruel and he used to sort of annihilate people with his humor so that was him getting out the pain but he couldn't express true emotions so and I could you know so it, it was a matter of taking a lot of time to draw the real John out I don't think I ever did obviously but uh, I did try did he ever recover from the tragedy of his mother do you think no, I don't think he did. I think I cushioned a lot of blows that he was beating himself up with. I think that's that's about all I could do because I couldn't get any any further into his psyche. I don't think anybody did, really. I think he constantly, most of his life, it was, it was a bit of an act. I don't think the real John Lennon actually um, revealed himself, even to his death. I really don't believe that. You write in the book, as you said earlier, about his comments regarding disabled people and also homosexuality. Um, He wasn't complimentary at all. Was this just a facade? Was this just an act? Or did he really not like these type of people? No, I think he was frightened. I think he was terrified. And I think he he liked to shock. You know, his his way of grabbing attention was shocking people. And I think that's that has proved itself right most through most of his life. He he was an exhibitionist through shocking. People and shocking, uh, you know, when en- anybody thought they knew him, he'd make sure that they didn't by shocking them. The irony, though, is when he was at his peak with the Beatles, they couldn't have been more mainstream, really, in a way. If you think of their music now, I mean, the music was nice. I mean, there was they were rock and roll, but it was nice. There wasn't anything as extreme, and certainly the image of the band wasn't extreme at that time. Well, I think to, to the Americans it was, to a certain extent. You know, these long-haired louts from Liverpool <laughs> or whatever. I mean, long hair, if you look at hair, I mean, it wasn't long at all. Uh, it was it was ridiculous how how they were vilified for, for being scruffy. I mean, they were suited and they had beautifully coiffured, you know, 
quite long hair, but not outrageous compared to the stones in, in, in that respect. But um, they were four together. They were a unit, um, and their music was them, the four of them together. And that's the magic that they produced. Uh, they were the best of mates. They were their own family. Were you in fear of him after the first time he hit you? Not really, because... What happened then? I mean, John was very, very jealous and very possessive. And I think he actually said that later on in his life in an interview, but not to me. But I mean, I I was aware of his jealousy and I was aware not of his violence because I hadn't seen his violence at that point. But I mean, he didn't beat me up. I mean, he, he just smacked me across the face and I hit my head against the pipe in college. and And... At that point, I thought, well, I, I've never experienced this in my life and I don't want to see it again, and I didn't. But it, you forgave him? Well, it took three months. I left him at that point and, <laughs> and said, on your bike, to a certain extent, I'm not, you know, I, why should I put up with this? Um, and there'd been an awful lot of nurturing and looking after his, his delicate ego at that time and his, his pain. And I thought, well, you know, I can only go so far and no further. So uh, it took three months before he actually phoned me and we got back together again because I loved him, you know, it's as simple as that. When I read about this side of his life and this side of your life, of course, it made me think about people who put up with abuse. And I think it must be for the reason that you just said, if you love someone so much, you'll forgive anything. But that doesn't make that behaviour right. Did he ever have any remorse openly towards you? Did he ever say he was sorry? Did you ever discuss it again? Oh yes, I mean he was desperately sorry. He didn't it was it was an instant. It was something that he couldn't help himself and he didn't do it again. And I wouldn't have been with him if he had. In fact, that was the first and last time that he ever lifted a finger or a hand to me. Um so he learned his lesson. But he did um on the odd occasion have a few altercations with other people in his life when he couldn't help it and it was to do with booze at the time he could not take his drink John do you think it came out of the fact he couldn't articulate his emotions and his thoughts or where did the pent up anger come from well it came as we said before about from his upbringing from the what was going on in his life he didn't know what he wanted he didn't know where he was going uh, we were in love with each other. He was frightened of losing me because he'd lost everything else in his life that he loved. And that was the 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 moment when it just, you know, his brain sort of... Um, how can I say it? <laughs> um, he just broke up, he cracked, he just for one split second, and it was over. I mean, that was how John was but not to me anymore. In fact, funny enough, having, when we had Julian and I became pregnant and we got married and it all happened, marriage for John was, was lovely and for me it was lovely. And all that sort of anger seemed to disappear because they had the fame at that time, they top of the world, top of the pops, top of most of the popper most and all that. So life was good. So he didn't have that angst then, but that was always there. As soon as he stopped, you know, when they were on the road, it was it was great. When they were successful, it was great. It was when he, they stopped, that's when it all came back to him, that pain and that anguish. The question I've got to ask is, you got married so quickly afterwards, and in those days that was it, you got pregnant, you got married. Do you think you would have got married had you have not got pregnant? Probably not. I've no idea. I mean, looking back, it's very hard to look back. In retrospect, you think, well, this might have happened, and would that have happened? And I have no idea it happened. You know, it's something that happened, thank God, uh, because I have a son who's fantastic, and if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have the son. I wouldn't have had the, the life and experiences that I've had. Um, but yes, we got married because you did in those days, but we wanted to get married. That was the choice that we could have chosen not to, but we chose to get married. You mentioned people like Mimi earlier who certainly were not encouraging your marriage. Um, they didn't approve of it. Did that matter to you? 
Well, yes. I mean, everybody wants to be happy and loved and and the family to be around. I mean, it was it was a very bizarre marriage, you know, <laughs> by comparison to any other marriage. But Auntie Mimi made it very clear that she didn't want anything to do with it. Um, she told him he was stupid. He made a, an absolute fool of himself. Um, and she didn't want to speak to him again. So she didn't come to the um, wedding. My mother was in Canada. So we had a very bizarre wedding, which, but I wouldn't change a thing because it was hysterical. It was a very funny wedding. There was even something worse than the fact that they didn't turn up. You were accused at the time of getting pregnant deliberately so that you could marry John. Personally, that was the last thing in, in my life that I had even imagined. I didn't want to get married. I didn't want children. I wanted to finish off my, my art college career. I wanted to be a teacher. I failed my my final exams because of this, you know. So, so my life was totally devastated. Never mind John's. I don't think anybody could accuse you of jumping on the bandwagon because you were with him far before he had any success. Well, I was on the bandwagon, wasn't I? <laughs> yes, you were driving it, really, weren't you? <laughs> you know, I've always had a great respect for the fans. Uh, they've always been really great with me. You know, even in the beginning, you know, when I had a baby and, oh, God, they'd lost their John and everything else, but, but they took me to their hearts. And it was a situation that I've read so many books. So, well, I have never bought them, but people send them to me, so I read them. And I sometimes I have an awful lot of it is factually right but emotionally wrong. And I think having lived with John and being part of his life so intimately when i when i have read all these other books and i thought well i don't even know who that person is and i'm reading about me i don't even know who john is i'm reading about john and these are some of these people are actually old school friends or uh, they're writing a book because it's going to make a lot of money because it's about the beatles etc etc and i thought well it's about time that i put my mark from my perspective um, and hopefully it will fit into all these and people people will read if they want to they will believe what they want to believe so when you write a book you take a big chance and, and when I wrote this I was I was really quite nervous I thought right I'm I'm taking a big chance here because I'm going to upset a few people because they have this this preconceived idea or of John and what they've read about John. And I really want them to know the truth uh, from my point of view and from Julian's point of view because it's as much for him as it is for me. How much have you kept for yourselves? Is there still stuff that you haven't put in the book that you just want to keep private between you and Julian? Well, there's so much that, I mean, you couldn't write a book, I mean, uh, to put everything in. You can only as best you can uh, put in the essence, the heart and the soul into it. You can't possibly put every second of every day into it. Um, I can't think of anything more, to be perfectly honest, and I'm, I'm very pleased about that because I really don't want to carry on and do a second and do a... That's not... This is a one-off for me. It truly is. If I do another book, it'll be to do with my art painting, poetry, something totally different from Beatles. But this was my last um, swan song, I think it's called. You mentioned your wedding day earlier, and as you said, it was different. Are you happy with it now looking back? Do you wish it had been different from even how different it was? No, it was, it was so typically John and Paul and George and Brian and me. And no mother, no family, no, no, I mean, no photographers. We haven't even got a photograph of the of the wedding. And the guy that that married us looked as though he was he was doing a funeral, never mind a marriage. And behind the window where the guy was standing uh, was this guy with a um, pneumatic drill who through the whole of the ceremony was was doing his pneumatic drill. And it was just funny. It was so funny. I mean, the whole whole experience was bizarre but it was quite beautiful at the same time it was very naive very innocent and they all looked they all had you know their suits on <laughs> which and i i can still see them and white faced i mean truly they were absolutely panic stricken <laughs> uh, and i had i had nothing really i had an old suit 
a blouse that Astrid gave me from Germany. Um, and I put my hair up, which I never did. It was it was just weird. And Brian ordered a car to take me there, and it poured with rain. And we had afterwards we went to Reese's, you know, famous cafe in Liverpool, for our wedding lunch. What we, did you have? Chicken, I think it was. <laughs> it was it was meal of the day. Well, I think it was soup, uh, roast chicken, and trifle. <laughs> and we had water or lemonade because they didn't have a, a wine license. So, <laughs> so it was a really extravagant um, wedding lunch. That's perfect. 1961 was the year that um, you went to the famous cavern and, and they did their first show. They appeared there regularly. And, of course, uh, a friend of yours uh, took your coats most nights, Scylla Black. I love Scylla. I really love Scylla. And she, she, she said something. I hadn't seen her for many, many years. And I was in Barbados because um, I'm remarried and the guy is from Barbados and what have you. And she was there with Paul O'Grady, Lily Savage at the time. And we espied each other across um, this restaurant, and it was great. I hadn't seen her for years, so we got together. And we were having dinner where we were staying, and we invited her and, and her friend, Pat, over. And she said something really lovely to Julian, which I will, I will never forget, and it was so sweet, because he's had a bad time, you know, thinking that he was rejected and his dad didn't care about him and everything. And Scylla sat there and she said, you know, Julian, uh, if it hadn't been for your dad, I wouldn't be sitting here now. She said, because Brian wanted to get rid of me. And your dad said, no way, you've got to have Syl. Keep Syl on. So Julian's little face, you know, it was beautiful because he'd only ever had bad thoughts about his father. And this coming from Scylla, you know, the great Scylla. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. Well, yeah. she surprised me and she surprised Julian. I thought that was great. As you say, Julian does write a couple of things in the book where he says he felt humiliated and rejected and unimportant in his dad's life. But do you think that's because his dad died so young and he didn't get the rest of his life, which he probably wanted with him? I think what, what happened was that he was rejected. It's as simple as that. I mean, everybody was rejected when, when John married Yoko. Uh, all his old friends, all all his family, everyone was was um, pushed aside for 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 something that John thought was the most important thing in the world, uh, and it's understandable. Yes, if if his father had lived, it might have changed. It hopefully it would have done. That would have been wonderful, but it didn't. So all Julian's memories were one of from the age of he hardly ever saw his father and then he loses his father and then he loses his father another time a little bit, a bit like John himself Now you were there from the first moments and creation of the Beatles I can't imagine any of you ever dreamed that it would be as big as it was taking the world by storm literally How was it for you though being a wife and a mother did you wish inside in your private moments that it wasn't so big so that you could have spent more time with John? I'd had I'd had quite a few years with John as a student, and that was you know, twenty four hours a day, basically when we could. Um, but I think being at, when they became famous, it was like being in the eye of the storm. Truly, I mean, we moved to this mansion, and and I had great responsibilities with gardeners, with housekeepers, with all the things that I'd never at the age of twenty three, four never ever experienced before I had no idea um, so really my my task and what was happening to me was looking after Julian uh, primarily most important thing and then running uh, what is it TCB taking care of business answering all the fan mail doing all that sort of thing so my my time was taken up with a great deal but also it was fantastic because they were you know they were worldwide success it was so exciting it was wonderful and when he came home it was the best when he was away it was good because you knew that he was happy and he was making a lot of money and as long as he was happy that was all that mattered to be perfectly honest did you ever consider at that point that he could have played away from you or that he could be up to no good do you know i was so naive 
and I prefer to stay naive, actually. What you don't know, you don't worry about. But obviously now, in, in, in later years, you read about what he got up to. I mean, he would never admit that, but they were, they were all at it. They were all up to it, and they still are. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to tell us more about that? No, <laughs> no, no, I'm just, no, I'm... I'm on that on that note, I'm saying no more. All right, we'll move on. But it really didn't occur to you at the time that he would have even dreamed of, of going with anyone else? Nope, not at all, no. That's amazing. And when he came back to you, those times were just exciting and you were just thrilled to see him because the big star was back. Well, my husband was back and, and the father of my son was back and he was happy to be home because he wasn't in a hotel room with groupies and <laughs> having fun. You've got to be <laughs> careful with those else? groupies, haven't you? It was a naive period, you know. I mean, it's, they were the first big, big uh, group to make it. So it hadn't happened before in, on that level. So how would you know about it unless it had been going on beforehand? Do you have one memory from the Beatles that stands out beyond all the rest? Well, I think the most incredible experience was when they did Shea Stadium for the first time. I mean, that was unbelievable. You couldn't hear them, you could see them. I mean, the atmosphere in that place was just electric, tingling. I mean, you, and you'd look at your husband and, and the boys, little boys who used to go to school next door to college and, and Ringo, you know, I mean, just to see them in that setting and be there and be part of it was just brain blowing. Where's the line between tingling, amazing and terrifying? Because I know you write in the book that you went to one concert and you had to be taken out because everybody used to push forward and, and the fans were just so fanatical, literally. Did it become scary at times? Well, I was only on that one occasion. I only went to America on that one occasion. The rest of the time, um, none of us went. The girls, the wives, the, the children, whatever. Uh, but yes, um, obviously. But it was too exciting to be frightened. Do you know? I mean, I was saved. I mean, I was dragged by a policeman and carried over and shoved into the car, but I was saved. If I hadn't been, I probably wouldn't be talking to you now. Mm. But it could be very, very dangerous, yeah. Do you think it was deliberate that you only went on tour with them once to America? I think it was... It was uh, made a lot of sense, actually, because it was no fun, really, because you were in one hotel room. It was lunacy, total lunacy, it was guys like you taking, doing interviews, uh, models walking in and out, um, demand, demand, security men outside, mad fans trying to climb up drain pipes and uh, getting in the lift. I mean, oh, it was total, total lunacy. So it wasn't a place for anybody other than them and Brian to be. I think in most people's perceptions, they probably remember more about Yoko than they do about you, which is odd because you were there for longer, and of course you were there during his rise to fame. How do you personally view Yoko Ono now? Well, I, you know, I mean, I think because Yoko is a conceptual artist, she's an exhibitionist, and I'm not. That's probably why. Um, you know, it's like it's like a story. I mean, it, their love story is was highly, highly promoted. Our love story was very, very low key in terms of press because in the early days, you know, I was not supposed to be married, John was not supposed to be married, he was not supposed to be a father. So going through that was, was quite normal for us. But with John and Yoko, it was worldwide and, and demanding attention. That's the difference. Why did he leave you? Well, he's not here to tell you. Did you know it was coming? I knew that we were both walking a different path. We were we we'd come to a cross crossroads that he wanted to go one way and I wanted to go the other way. Not that I had much choice because he was taking a lot of drugs. He'd stopped working. They were working in the studio. John always had itchy feet. He always wanted to do something new. He was. Um, through taking acid, LSD, I think his, his vision of the future and his vision of himself did not include what, what he had, which was us. It was, it was from stopping being world famous on the stage with the Beatles, they stopped. Brian died, they stopped. And he was in a space that he didn't know what kind of space it was. 
because he hadn't been in that space very often because he'd been working for six years like the rest of them. All of a sudden there was nothing and uh, it's all down to luck and timing who walked into that space at the time. When I read about his drug addiction, um, one thing I didn't like was how he pressured you to try LSD. Um, you write in the book how you didn't want to do it and he slipped it in a drink or somebody did. That's not nice, is it, really? Um, was that the first signs that you thought, this is out of control? Well, it was it was nightmarish for me, the whole thing. I did as much as I could to be on the same wavelength because that's what you do if you're married and, and you know that things are... Um, everything's changing slightly, but you don't know which way it's going. So I thought, well, I'll try and see what, what all this is all about, you know, and see how how uh, it affects me and it, it, for me it was absolute nightmare and for an awful lot of other people I mean, it's very very dangerous I know that and I could have I could easily have jumped out of a window under the influence of, of LSD but at the time of course it was it was put to me as that we're all friends here and we're going to look after you and everything else but if you're if you're under the influence of something that you can't control Nobody can look after you, especially if they're all taking the same thing at the same time. So for me, it was definitely out. At the beginning, I said that I felt, having read this book, that John Lennon was flawed in many ways. Um, the drugs, he needed an extreme. And I think the same with Yoko Ono. Was he just looking for another thrill? I think he was trying to find himself uh, what he called a soulmate, someone who had as, as mad ideas as he had. Um I think he felt that she had the talent, but that's debatable um, because he was the one with the talent and always will be. And But he needed that. He didn't need a mumsy um, partner at that point. He needed a mate. And I think he, he actually said at, at some stage in an interview that, you know, she's the nearest thing to a man, a mate man, that he's ever had in a woman. What are your thoughts about her now? I mean, she's written so much, she's said so much and done so many interviews about John. Do you think she's taken away from his life or do you think she's added to it? Um, that's a difficult question. It's, And that should be put open to the audience <laughs> rather than to me. I just, I just feel that um, she has taken over an awful lot of stuff that should be spread around. No one person should own another person's talent. It should be uh, given to the world. You've remarried now and you're happy and you've got Julian. Are you happy? I mean, is everything OK with you? How do you feel about everything so many years on, 20 years after John died? I'm still learning. <laughs> Life is a lesson and the answer's at the end. And, and I'm open to all kinds of experiences and that's what life's all about. I'm very happy at the moment. Cynthia, thank you so much for spending the time to talk to us today. It's been riveting and fascinating. I think we're all curious to find out about his life because he really is the most famous person in the world ever, really. And for you to spend so many years with him, being a part of his life is such a thrill. No matter who tries to take it away, you'll never lose that. I think I've I've been privileged um, in one way. Uh, it's been an experience that nobody else can possibly um, compare with it. And it's been very special. I suppose with every high there's a low, isn't there? Well, ups and downs every day. You never know what's around the corner, do you? Cynthia Lennon, thank you very much for talking to us. You're very welcome.